Hello and welcome to the Start Here podcast for web development. My name is Dane Miller, and we're here to teach you how to build a career in web dev. You can find us online at starthere.fm. Okay, guys, so before we move on to the next section, we just want to wrap up this, this bit on the in-person interview that has these six segments in it. And Josh just mentioned something to me that was really interesting that I want you guys to hear. It was about making sure that you tell a story in your interview and throughout the whole process of the interview, making sure that you do tell a story. Josh, can you speak to that for a minute? Absolutely. That's my whole philosophy with interviewing. Um, if I could sum up my interviewing strategy in, in one sentence, it's that you are telling a story about how the company will be better if you're a part of it. And so everything you do in the interview is designed to help tell that story. So you prepare and you answer questions in a certain way and you think about their goals and everything you're doing is trying to show them that they're going to be better if they bring you on board. And that will increase chances that you get a good job offer, but then also encourage them to make you the best job offer possible because they want to bring you on board because they're so convinced that they're going to be a better company once you're a part of their team. Mm. That's great advice. Another key piece of advice, guys, that I hope you take from Josh here. Now, if you've never thought about the concept of storytelling, if you don't work in marketing, if you don't work in advertising, if you are not a writer, you probably have never thought about the concept of storytelling. But I would definitely think about that in the way that you approach your goals and especially in the way that you approach these interviews because people get... Re so, for instance, if you notice online, some of the publications that have articles that get shared the most, they usually have a narrative format. So people love narrative. It's just some kind of psychological thing where they love narrative and they love being part of a story. They love you know hearing your stories. So this is really key advice I hope you guys take. Okay, thanks, Josh. So moving on to the next section, let's say uh, they complete this in-person interview. They go and they kill it. They knock it out of the park. They were prepared. They give a good challenging situation that aligns with the company's goals and key uh, measurements. Now, they get a call back. On this callback, perhaps they're asked the dreaded salary question. Now, how do you suggest that your students handle this question? Again, guys, the question, what we're talking about here is when the interviewer will call you back or ask you in the in-person interview, what are you currently making and what are you looking to make? This is a very dreaded question for a lot of people because there's a lot of diverse ways to handle this, but Josh has a very good strategy for handling this. So Josh, could you speak to that for a bit? Absolutely. Uh, one reason that I think this is a dreaded question is that it can be very sneaky. Um, it, the timing of it is usually actually very early in the interview process. And so it will, the, the candidate will be in the mindset of, I just need to get through this call so I can get to the next call, so I can get to the next call, so I can get through this interview process and eventually get a job offer. And so when that's your mindset and someone comes up to you and says, hey, um, we're going to set up an interview for you. By the way, what are you currently making and what would you like to make if you come on board? Then you're in that sort of mode where you're just trying to answer their questions and continue moving forward. And so um, it can be tricky because you're not expecting the kind of question that you might not want to answer in the way that they expect. Um, and so you're, you're kind of inclined to comply with them and just give them the information they ask for. When the reality is if you do that, you could cost yourself a lot of money later on after you get a job offer when you're trying to negotiate. So the way that I recommend that you handle this question is to kind of break it into two parts. The first part is the current salary part of the question. And then the second part is the uh, desired salary is what I call it. So for the current salary part, so if they say, where are you right now in terms of salary? I think a good answer for that is just to tell them, I'm not really comfortable sharing that. I'd prefer to focus on the value I can add to your company and not what I'm paid at my current job. And so you'll see this aligns really nicely with my kind of story idea from before. So you're basically saying, I'd like to talk about the story where I become a part of your company and it's really great, not details about my previous employment or my current employment. So that's the, the first part, the current salary part. Basically, you just say, I'm not really comfortable talking about that. I'd like to talk about the opportunity in front of me. You can even add to that saying something like, and I, I'm wondering if you think this is a good idea, Josh, you could add to that, say exactly what you just said, but also add, I'm not really concerned about money. This isn't really a money thing for me. I'm just looking for a good fit. And that's what I would like to focus on first. Is that acceptable? I do think it is acceptable. Um, the one reason I might push back just a little bit is that later on you're going to negotiate your salary. And so uh, it, it can yeah. seem a, a teeny bit contradictory. I don't think this true 
ultimately yeah. is going to, it's not going to matter a whole lot one way or the other, but it can, depending on who you're talking to. And if you say that to one person and then later you're actually negotiating with that same person, mm -hmm. um, then they might be like, well, I thought you said that money wasn't important to you and now you're negotiating. Um, yep. And that identifies a character flaw, really. It could, it could. I, I don't could, think, could. you know, I wouldn't put too much weight on it. I think your answer is a fine answer. Um, and, and I, you know, I wouldn't say don't give that answer, but there is a, a way that that could come back and, and maybe have, um, some, you know, slightly negative repercussions during your negotiation later on. Yep. Great advice. Okay. Next section. So the next one is your desired salary. So they've asked you what's your current salary. And you said, I'm not comfortable sharing that. I prefer to focus on this opportunity. And then they also said, and what are you looking for if you make this move? Um, and so I think, uh, the way to answer this question, again, um, this will resonate with the story narrative that I talk about is something like, um, you know, tell them I want this move to be a big step forward for me in terms of both responsibility and compensation. And so again, what you're telling them is uh, that story about, I can add value to your company. So I want this to be a big step forward. I want to take on more responsibility and in exchange for that additional responsibility and all the value I'm going to add to your company, I'd like to also get more compensation. So um, this is interesting because you don't actually tell them numbers. So you're not saying more compensation than some number, but what you're doing is you're signaling to them that you want more responsibility. You want to add value to the company. And you're also letting them know, I'm expecting a competitive job offer. When we get there later on, I'm going to continue to impress you through the interview. When we get through the interview, you're going to want to make me an offer. And I want to put it in your mind now that you should make me a really strong job offer because I'm bringing a lot of value. And so this is sort of, you're setting this up for later on so that your offer is strong. That's great advice. And somebody that has been a hiring manager for developers, I know that if somebody approaches me, and I've never had anybody say that, but if I if I found a candidate approach me and say those specific words, I would immediately identify, they said, I want more responsibility. I'm looking for this to be an up in my, uh, a step up in my career. And I would like a matching salary for that responsibility. That doesn't identify any kind of negative trait to me. What it does show me is that this person is on point. Like this person is looking for more responsibility. He's overachieving. He doesn't want to stay at the status quo. Usually to me, people like that, it's worth, it's worth really investing in people like that because they're always going to keep growing at your job that you hire them for. So that's great advice. I really like that, Josh. Great. Yeah. I think, you know, you're, you're indicating to them that you're going to add value, that you want to make their company better. And you just kind of keep banging that drum throughout the, inter the interview process. That's sort of the, the theme um, that I teach is, is just keep telling that story about how they're going to be better. And eventually they'll, they'll just kind of throw their hands up and say, you know, I'm convinced. Um, and that's your goal is to convince them throughout the interview process. So now we've discussed the full flow from submitting a, re a LinkedIn profile to building your LinkedIn to we briefly touched on all the types of interviews and how to handle those and even how to deal with the salary question a little bit. Is there anything that you want to cover before we move on on anything? Is there anything else that you want to cover that perhaps you didn't get a chance to talk about on any of those interviews or that salary question? I know a lot of your course focuses on uh, negotiating your salary, which we might talk about next, but is there anything that you want to cover for that first question that they get? Or did we go, or did we already cover everything? I think there's one more thing that I'll throw out there that could be really helpful. Um, even though we talked earlier about preparing for your interview and learning everything you can about the company before you start interviewing, um, you want to continue to learn as you interview. So a lot of companies nowadays, um, have a, an interview process that is sort of, um, prolonged and grueling. Um, and what I mean is, you know, you literally might go through five or 10 different interviews with different people. Um, and those can be tiring, but they can also all be opportunities to learn more about the company and continue to prepare and build your knowledge base of what the company is about and what they're trying to do and how you can help them. So um, the last thing to think about is usually at the end of these um, personal interviews where you're through the technical interview and now you're talking to hiring managers and colleagues you might work with and other people in the company, usually at the end, the interviewer will say, okay, well, we've got about five minutes left. Do you have any questions for me? And this is a great opportunity to one, demonstrate that you're tuned in and that you're paying attention to them, but two, to learn more things about the company and the team you might be working with and things like that, that you can leverage in your future interviews to, to stand out even more. So uh, maybe I'll run through just a few common questions that you could have ready to go so that if you get that opportunity that you can actually make good use of that time and ask questions that will get you more information and also demonstrate to the interviewer that you're really tuned in. 
So the, the first question I like to ask is how long have you worked there and what is it like? So whoever you're talking to, um, this can be, you know, the hiring manager, it can be a recruiter at the beginning of the process. But if they ask you, you know, do you have any questions? You can ask them how long they've been with the company, what it's, what it's like. And you might learn a lot about the company culture. Usually they'll tell you a couple of things. Oh, I really like this and this about the company. This is a little bit annoying, but it's okay. Um, but those are all things that you can kind of um, file away so that you have them available. So you, you can learn more about the company, but also maybe you can emphasize some of those things that the person liked. And now there are things that you might like working about, uh, uh, like about working at the company, and you can bring those up in future interviews. Uh, asking about the company culture, what's the company culture like is really important. This is an informational question for you. I think it's important to evaluate when you're interviewing, you're also learning about the company and you want to make sure it's the kind of company you want to work for. So asking just directly, what's the company culture like can give you a lot of information that can be valuable as you form your opinion of how interesting this opportunity is to you as a candidate. But it can also, again, give you some information that you can use later when you learn more about the culture. Now you can think of yourself as part of that culture and give answers that fall in line with the telling a story about how you can make the company better. The more you know about the company, the easier it is to demonstrate that you can help make it better. Another one is, what does the long-term career path look like for this position? So I think this is a really important one for people who um, are transitioning in, into new careers, like a lot of um, your listeners here at Start Here might be, right? And that is, okay, well, I'm trying to get my first job with this new skill set, but what do the next three jobs look like? Where am I going? Um, am I going to fall into a management track if I stay here? Can I be a technical lead of some kind eventually? You know, what, what does my path look like? And is that a path that I want to pursue? And of course, this is another opportunity to learn about future jobs so that you can demonstrate in your interviews, I'm a good candidate for this current job that I'm applying for, but I also know what the next couple of jobs are in the career path. And here's why I'm really looking forward into growing into those jobs and being a part of the company long term. And the last one is, what can you tell me about the team I'll be working with? So this is a great question because there's a good chance that the answer to this question will tell you information about other people who may be interviewing you. And so there are some ways that this can really help you to be more comfortable in those interviews. Um, you might learn something about a hobby that somebody has and you could say, oh, hey, I, I heard you like to play basketball on the weekends. I play basketball too. I played in high school, right? Um, and find ways to, to, to kind of bring commonalities out. Um, but you, you might also learn about personalities that people have so that you don't misread cues that you get in interviews. So maybe, uh, the next person that you're going to talk to is Bob and Bob is kind of a curmudgeon. And that's good to know that before you talk to Bob, because that means that maybe he's not, you know, really, you know, um, hamming it up with you and having a good time, but that's just his personality. So you don't want to read too much into that and be discouraged during the interview and just kind of look past it. So learning about the team you'll work with can give you a lot of good information that can help you answer questions well, and also kind of prepare for those individuals. So those are four different questions that I like to have ready to go uh, if you have an opportunity to ask questions in an interview. And the great thing about all of them is you can ask them over and over again to every person who interviews you and usually get more and different information that can be helpful throughout the process. Yep, that's great advice. So I want to unpack a little bit of what you just said. I want to unpack three different things. This episode might run a little bit long, guys, but Josh is delivering so much value on this episode. I want to make sure that we cover everything that we possibly can to help you guys. So the first thing is you mentioned, you mentioned it being an in-person interview. What kind of value do you place on body language? So like there's a lot of uh, physiology science around mirroring and how that can psychologically affect the way people read you. So if you're talking to somebody at an interview and they're leaned forward, ag like aggressive at the table, the theory states that you should lean forward as well to mirror them. And likewise, if they're kind of leaned back with their arms crossed and they're breathing and they're speaking low, then you should mirror that as well, such that you, you come off as most likable to that person. Josh, do you have any experience or place any importance on those types of theories? So I'll be honest before I give my answer that I haven't thought a lot about this. Um, but as you were talking, I do have some opinions on it. Um, so I think, I think the first thing is, you know, sometimes you'll be interviewing in person. I think a lot of what you just said also applies to um, verbal and video conversations as well. Um, and I think that you want to try to engage the person in a way that's comfortable for both of you. Um, and so, um, you know, you could mirror, you know, I kind of vocally mirror um, uh, people, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of different people and sometimes I'll kind of be, you know, really amped up and Hey, this is a great time. And sometimes I'll be a lot more laid back, um, because they're a laid back person and I want to try and match them. So I think that is, um, 
a good strategy to have. I, I also think though, that the first thing that you should do is just try to be comfortable. And so if you're, if you're not that experienced with interviewing, um, you don't want to overwhelm yourself by trying, you know, more advanced body language mirroring and that kind of thing. If you're, if you're not able to just, just relax, you know, if you, if you can just relax, that is a huge advantage to you because so many people will go into the same interview and they're just tense and they're not giving good answers and they're, you know, shaking maybe, and they're nervous and their mouth is drying out. And so if you can just relax and take it easy and say, I'm just going to go in, I'm going to be calm. I'm going to just talk to this person. Like I know them already. I'm going to answer their questions honestly, and it's going to be great. Um, that's a great first step. And then if, if you get to the point where you're extremely relaxed in an interview, then you can start kind of trying to, 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 to play off of the person that you're talking to verbally or visually and say, well, how can I make this person more comfortable with me? And you can do things like mirroring, but you could also think, well, just how would I talk to this person if I ran into them um, at a cocktail party or uh, at, in, a, in the lobby at a movie theater or something like that? And mirroring, guys, it sounds kind of woo-woo or something like that, but it really doesn't have to be so technical. Like Josh mentioned, only do this if you're already comfortable. But if you are already comfortable, it's very simply just approaching somebody in a way that they will like you. So if they're not super hype, they probably won't like if, if you're super hype. And that's just the way people are. If they're super hype and you're super laid back, that's a, even for me as a hiring manager, when I get on the phone with somebody, and in fact, I'll tell you a little story about this, guys, about this, not about the, the negatives of not mirroring. So one of the best front end web developers I've ever met in my seven years of working in this career, working with hundreds and hundreds of front end web developers, this guy is the best. He's the most critical thinking, the best at animations, the best at front end web design. And I wanted him to work at the company I work. And so I recommended him. My, I'm the director of engineering, so obviously he got an interview. And the funny thing was, I was on the phone with him and my boss, so the person that I report to. And this guy was not mirroring us in any way. We were very excited, and we were communicating enthusiastically and passionately. And this guy was on the phone, and he was very, very, he, he was meek. He was hard to understand, almost like hard to hear. His answers were very short. And he was just overall a little nervous, not, he was, he was the opposite of mirroring in every way. Um, so, and, and then he didn't get the job, even though he's, I know personally that he's the best, I would have hired him anyway. It doesn't matter because the way that you come off guys in your first impression and your second impression, third impression, it really matters. So these types of techniques, you don't have to go too advanced with them, but just, just keep in mind, you want to be enthusiastic if you're talking to somebody who's enthusiastic, et cetera, et cetera. So that's good advice, Josh. Uh, so the second thing that I wanted to unpack in what you said a minute ago was the culture. You mentioned culture. So this this term gets bandied about a lot. What is a company's culture? You know, the, a lot of people have a lot of confusion around this topic. And because it's such a buzzword, people have even more confusion because they place uh, in, inappropriate things as being the culture of a company. Guys, the culture of a company isn't really what the company vision is. It's more of how is the day-to-day -day relationships of the company done? So like, is it an informal culture? Is it a very formal kind of corporate culture? Is there a lot of documentation in the culture, meaning it's very formal? Like, So the, t the way that a company's culture can be portrayed is very different. And Josh, I'm just curious in your opinion, like how would you explain to somebody if they asked you, what is culture? What is a company culture? I think you did a pretty good job of summing it up there and that it's, it's about when I talk about company culture and I think you're right, there are a million definitions that are out there. But when I talk about company culture, I'm talking about the people that I'm going to be working with and how I'll get along with them. And that starts first at the, you know, the manager I'm going to be working for, the team I'm going to be working with, and then maybe the practice that I'll be a part of, and then the division, and then all the way up to the CEO. Um, and so I, I think it's about, you know, who are these people and am I going to be comfortable working with them? And so, you know, I can think of a, a job that I had a number of years ago. It was working for a pretty small company and um, we hired somebody in. I, I was not the hiring manager, but this person was brought in and you could tell right away they weren't like the other people working at the company. It was a relatively young company with a sort of startup atmosphere with, you know, free snacks in the fridge. And this person was brought in um, and clearly was much more senior, much more experienced, um, probably pretty set in the way that he did things. And you could tell right away that he wasn't a cultural fit and it wasn't anything good or bad about him or good or bad about us. It was just that we were so different that it was hard to see how am I going to work with that person every day? And how is he going to be comfortable with this environment that seems so different than the other environments that he's worked with. 
Same situation as you, Josh. I worked at a startup where there was ping pong tables everywhere, free snacks in the fridge, and we had guys come in in a suit for a senior engineering position. And a lot of the times we would write them off because regardless of what kind of answer as to why they're wearing the suit, it doesn't matter because even if it's misunderstanding of what type of the company is, that that's a bad sign. It means they didn't do their research or they didn't know. And if they're wearing a suit just because they wanted to make a good impression, clearly they don't understand the culture because making a good uh, because making a good impression, guys, is matching the culture. It's not necessarily wearing a suit. That That is like this thing that people have in their minds, like, oh, dressing up is making a good impression. That's not necessarily the case. Making a good impression is being culturally aligned. And like Josh said, culture specifically means the environment and the relationships and the type of ways in which the team that you're on interacts. And I would break culture down even to a team by team level. So a lot of the times at these big companies, culture will be different on different teams. So for instance, in the company that I work at, our engineering team has a very different culture than our content team, which has a very different culture than our executive team, which has a very different culture than our parent company's individual digital teams. Which So it's all different. And what you want to specifically ask in the interview is, what is the culture like of the team that I'll be working on? And typically the guy interviewing you will be working on that team. So he, he's got a lot of experience being able to tell you those things. Okay, so the third thing that I wanted to unpack real quick, and then we can move on to your, your best advice that I think you have, uh, is this whole track thing, the technical track or the management track. So a lot of people don't even know what this is or you know, what, what their options are. A lot of people are confused what the future of being a web developer looks like for them. Can you break down what the technical track, being a technical principal engineer uh, versus the management track, what those are? Sure, absolutely. Those those two tracks are the primary tracks that you'll usually uh, be a part of uh, at a company, and they're sort of what's called the management track, which means you know I'll start as a junior level, and then I'll move to a mid level, and then maybe a senior level, and then maybe one level above that, and then my next job, if I'm on the management track, is now I'm going to manage other people that are like me right now. So if I'm a developer or I'm a front end developer, or web developer, if I'm a project manager, I'm going to be you know junior, mid level, senior, and then eventually I'm going to manage a couple of project managers, or I'm going to manage a couple of software developers. And so that's the management track. Um, some people listening to this just cringed big time uh, when they heard that and they thought, I do not want to manage people and I hope that's not my only option. Uh, the good news is it's not. And there's the technical track. Most companies are, are offering this now and I've even worked at companies where we started creating roles for people who are proficient technically. They've gone through you know junior, mid-level, senior, and now they can move into sort of like a technical lead track which is a track where uh, I think mentorship is a good word for it, where they're not necessarily responsible for direct reports. They're not writing performance reviews or making compensation decisions, but they are responsible for helping shepherd a team of less senior people and helping to show them ways to do things and bounce ideas off of them, maybe train them on concepts and that sort of thing. And so that technical lead then can move into a place where um, they're still you know, if they're writing code, they're still writing code every day, or they're still uh, building front end applications every day or whatever they're doing, but they're also responsible for um, helping share knowledge among a team. And there are even senior technical folks who don't want any part of that. And, and there are companies where you can just become, you know, like a super senior front end developer, and you are just given the tough projects, the tricky projects, and you're expected to turn them around quickly. Um, so it's important to ask about that early because you want to make sure wherever you want to end up if you're going to get there soon. So if you're a junior developer, you may not worry about this, but if you're going to hire in as a senior developer or something like that, eventually, you want to know where do I go next and is there an opportunity for me to manage people if I want to do that? Or is there an opportunity for me to keep doing technical stuff and not be responsible for managing people if I prefer to do that? The senior interview is much different than the interviews that we're talking about here, guys. I know that most of the listeners are, are junior web developers or, or not even web developers yet, so you don't have to worry about this. But when you do get into the senior levels, it's much more of a headhunter type game. Uh, a lot more questions on the part of the person being interviewed about the company because when you're at that level, you're really making a change, not just for yourself, you're trying to accelerate the growth of a company. Because if somebody's hiring a very high level senior engineer, they're not doing it just because they need another body. They're doing it specifically to increase the bottom line because those types of people can really change things in a company. So just keep that in mind when you get to that level, it'll be a little bit different. Now, one thing that I wanted to speak about before we move on is let's attach some titles to this. 
so that you guys are familiar. So the technical track, what is the, the, the top of the mountain of the technical track? You might have heard that referred to as the CTO or chief technology officer. A lot of people are confused about this. Sometimes this differs on a company by company basis, so you can't take this as 100% fact, but typically the chief technology officer is somebody that came from that technical track. They went through junior, mid-level engineer, then to senior engineer, then to principal engineer usually, or directly to a sort of uh, director level technology or engineering person and then up into the chief technology officer. Now this person is usually responsible for overseeing system architecture, overseeing business efficiency from a programming perspective. So are our systems creating efficient business uh, logics, rules, definitions, things like that? They're gonna also be managing processes amongst developers and procedures. Now. Looking at the management track, usually the title that you hear associated to that, the top of the mountain in that track is a VP of engineering. So these sound similar, chief technology officer, VP of engineering, but they're completely in almost complete ends of the spectrum in what they handle and what they deal with. The VP of engineering is gonna be dealing with procedures, you know, direct reports, managing people, managing engineers. Also, usually the VP of engineering and the CTO work together extremely closely. So even though they're at different ends of the spectrum, uh, they're working together very closely. And oftentimes, guys, these roles can be blurred. And I, I, what I'm saying is not always 100% fact. Some companies, the CTO does everything, right? So at, at my company, the directors do everything. So it's like, the, this can be very blurred. But just so you know in your mind, when you see those types of roles, that's the end game for that sort of spectrum. Also, you could think about CIO versus CTO, so Chief Information Officer versus Chief Technology Officer. So what I'm recommending in general here, guys, is to do research on all these different things. If you're sitting here and you're confused about what the future looks like for you, what is the future of my career? What is the future of my job opportunities in web development? Well, research all the things that you could possibly think of. Research company titles at different levels for different types of companies as it relates to technology. Really get a firm grasp of what is available to you and then extrapolate down. So now let's move on, Josh, to the most important thing that I think you offer here. So the best value that I think Josh gives is on his specific practices and mindset around negotiating your salary after you get the job offer. So in this episode, we've walked through everything to do from finishing learning your skills to getting the job offer. We've, we've stopped right before you get that job offer. So Josh, let's pretend they get the email, they get the phone call, they get the voicemail, whatever it is saying, hey, you got the job, we're excited to have you. Uh, here's the salary that we're pitching. And you know, usually they say something like this, here's the salary that we're pitching and it's really our final offer. So you can kinda, it's really our only offer that we're putting on the table. So here's what we're offering. After they get that type of phone call or email, what do you recommend that they do to prepare or even think about how to approach that conversation? Because I know a lot of people are, are confused here. A lot of people just accept the first thing that they get, and you don't recommend that, do you? I definitely don't recommend it. Um, I think it's important uh, to negotiate. So that's, you know, if, there, if there's a service that I can provide today, it is to convince people that you should negotiate job offers when you get them. Um, that's the place, you know, right after the dreaded salary question, this is the next opportunity that you have that's a big opportunity to make more money uh, for doing the same job that you were already applying for. Uh, and if you don't negotiate, you could cost yourself a lot of money. And if you do negotiate, there's virtually no downside. Um, and let's, let's just say that one more time because it's so important. I'll let you continue. Negotiate your job offers, guys. You're not going to want to because your brain works in scarcity and fear-based modes a lot of the times. So when you get that job offer, you're going to say, well, shoot, I just got a job offer and I don't have any other job offers, so I better accept that. If you're able to go against that instinct, a lot of people do that. 90% of candidates do that. If you're able to go against that instinct, like Josh is about to tell you, you could double or even triple the salary that they were going to give you. That's not always the case. We can't say that's always the case, but it gives you that opportunity. That's exactly right. You can make huge strides. Um, typically, the way that, that I've engineered this process is you'll remember that we have not disclosed any numbers so far. Um, and so you will you can significantly exceed whatever you thought was possible by simply keeping your mouth shut early in the process and not telling them numbers. And the reason is that you are now kind of forcing them to disclose information in which you did not previously have. So 
Um, a big reason that I don't uh, recommend, or I recommend that you definitely do not um, share your current or desired salary is that, especially on the desired salary side, um, if you name a desired salary, you're pretty much just kind of guessing and hoping that the number that you uh, state is somewhere in the range of numbers that they are uh, looking to pay you. And so you're very literally guessing because you don't know how valuable the position is to the company. You don't know how excited they are to have you on board. You don't know how desperately they need to fill this position. You don't know any of those things. And so when you name a desired salary, you're just taking a shot and hoping that you don't miss. Um, and so by waiting for them to make an offer to you and not disclosing any salary numbers up to that point, now they have uh, given you insight into the range of salaries, at least that they're willing to pay. So, and you can even infer a little bit more than that. For example, it's unlikely they're going to offer you the very tippy top salary they're willing to pay for your skill set and experience because one, uh, they expect, uh, counter offers a lot of times, but two, um, maybe they're trying to get a little bit of extra value. And so by waiting for them to make an offer, now you've learned a lot about where they are. So from there, um, the process actually becomes pretty simple. Um, so going back to something you mentioned, Dane, you know, doubling and tripling your salary, usually that, that big jump in salary comes from not doing anything and waiting for that offer. And then once they've made that offer, they've said, this is about what we're, what we're looking to pay someone with your skill set and experience that adds the value that you bring to our company. And so now, um, instead of guessing, you've you've moved right into the ballpark. You've moved right into the, the sweet spot for where they're willing to pay. And your job is now to figure out what's the maximum they're willing to pay for my skill set and experience to bring me on board where we're both comfortable. So once you get that offer, you're going to counter offer. Uh, I've said a couple of times, you should negotiate, you should negotiate. Dane, you said you should negotiate. So we've said that a lot. So how do you do that? Um, you'll get an offer. Usually it's a verbal offer. Um, it, it's kind of a weird quirk of, of companies these days, but usually when you get a quote unquote written offer, it's actually pretty much just a description of the job that you've agreed to do for the salary you've agreed to do. Um, and so that you'll get a verbal offer and they'll say, well, we were thinking about offering you this, or they might even give you an informal, you know, email written offer or something. Um, but you know, getting a piece of paper on letterhead with a, with an offer usually doesn't happen until after you've, you've uh, ironed out all the details. So Let's assume that you get a verbal offer. This is pretty common where you'll actually talk to the hiring manager and they'll say, okay, we've, you know, we've, we've talked to you several times. Uh, we're, we're prepared to make you an offer. We just wanted to see what you think about it. Um, and then they'll, they'll make their offer to you. And so the first thing that you do is you say, okay, thanks for the offer. I really appreciate it. If it's okay with you, I'd like a day or two to think about it. Um, and the reason you're doing this is one, uh, so that you can think about it, uh, but two, so that you can actually formulate your counter offer and make a plan for the rest of your negotiation. Um, and so that's what you're doing is you're going to take a day or two um, and you're going to actually figure out what your counter offer should be. And then you're going to make a plan for once you deliver that counter offer, how are you going to proceed through the rest of the negotiation? Yeah, that's key. And guys, if you're really interested in learning about this more and I'll let Josh continue and we're going to tell you a little bit more on this episode, but go to fearlesssalarynegotiation.com. Just Google fearlesssalarynegotiation.com and you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see Josh actually has courses that you can buy on this. These courses contain eBooks, worksheets and templates, different things that you can actually say on the phone and case studies of this being successful. So if you're at all confused by the information that you're getting in this episode and you're not really sure how to apply it exactly, even though we're kind of giving you the outline and strategic and strategies of how to apply. If you're still confused, definitely go to fearlesssalarynegotiation.com and check out these courses that Josh offers. They're amazing, tremendous value in there. No, thanks a lot, Dane. Uh, I definitely appreciate people checking it out. And I think there is a lot of value there um, for, for everybody who's listening to this. So so um, the, the counteroffer um, uh, strategy that I use is pretty simple, which is you get that offer from them and then you're going to counteroffer 10 to 20% above it. And again, remember that you're already pretty close to um, the, you know, what range they're willing to pay in because they disclose that to you when they made you the first offer, right? And so now your job is to say, okay, well, you made me this offer, but I'm going to assume that's not the top range that you're willing to pay. And so now I'm going to try and, and, and push that number up until I figure out where they're actually comfortable paying me. Um, this is important because once you get into a company, it can be harder and harder to get big raises. You can do it. But the biggest opportunity that you have to maximize your salary and, and therefore maximize your long-term earning potential is when you change jobs. So this is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of interviewing and negotiating is this moment where you waited for an offer and now you're going to counter offer. So you'll counter offer 10 to 20% above their offer. And the, the kind of easy way to describe this is 10% means um, that's the baseline. And it means 
you're comfortable with the offer. You know that they're interested in having you on board. You don't detect that they're super anxious to hire you for, for whatever reason. They're interested in hiring you or they wouldn't have made you an offer, but they're not really desperate to hire you. Or maybe you're not you know, the ideal candidate for this position. And also that you would like to get this job. <laughs> so, so you're countering at 10%, which basically the way that I would describe it is you're being a little bit less aggressive um, so that you can kind of lock in that lower number and it feels more appropriate for your situation. 20% is when you know that they need to fill the position. You're a great candidate for it. Maybe they've indicated um, that they're desperate to fill the position. Somebody left two weeks ago and they're trying to fill it right now, or you have a specific skill set that you bring to bear that they can't find anywhere else. And maybe you have other alternatives or you it's not that you're not interested in the job, but you don't have to have the job. So you can be a little bit more aggressive. And so then you would counter at 20%. So the way that I recommend you deliver that counter offer is in an email. Um, and uh, Dane, in the show notes, we can link to uh, a page that I put up that actually has a sample counter offer email um, that you can, you, can, you can see. It's a real email that I have sent as a counter offer with the names and numbers changed. Um, copy pasted basically from my inbox or my outbox. Um, and so I recommend that you deliver the counter through an email um, because it also allows you to document your case and kind of reiterate again why it is that you add so much value to the company uh, and why you're counter offering. And so I think this is important because once you counter offer and you uh, kind of referred to the behind the scenes action earlier, Dane, um, once you counter offer, there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes that they do with that counter. It's not just a single person. Usually it's not just a single person who says yay or nay. They'll take that back to finance and maybe to another hiring manager, to the practice director and say, um, you know, this is Josh just countered at this number. What do we think about that? And so when you deliver your counter offer in a written email, you can also include your case and kind of reiterate all the points you've been making in all those interviews about how you add value to the company and how their story will be better when you're a part of it so that you're making your own case in writing that circulates along with your counter offer, which makes that counter offer more compelling and gives you an opportunity to really make a case to drive home why you're making that counter offer. That's great advice. And real quick, I just want to touch on the fear that people have around this. And I'm curious to get your opinion on this, Josh. So people, when they're hearing this, they're understanding and they're comprehending what you say, and they perhaps are even thinking to themselves, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. But in actuality, very few people do this. And I find that there's a lot of fear around this because if you, if you counter and they decline, a lot of people assume that you lose the job. Like you just completely lose the job offer. So at first, first of all, I'll say, don't live in so much scarcity, guys. Even if you lose a job offer, the, the world is abundant. There's hundreds of millions of job offers literally in the tech industry could not be possibly more abundant right now. No matter what you hear about the industry going up and down, up and down, doesn't matter. It's abundant. Think that way. Secondly, I've actually been in a situation where I requested 40% above. This is really crazy. And I requested way too much. And what they did was they didn't decline me because I had already done the things that Josh said. I already proven my, my value. So what they did was they said, hey, look, you know, I appreciate you wanting a little bit more salary, but we're a company, we're a startup right now. We can only offer you this 10% or 20% of what you uh, requested. Is that okay? And I, of course, was like, that's great. Let's, let's go ahead and do this. So the point is, I don't think a lot of this results in termination of the process. Josh, so have you found that to be the case where if somebody counters too high that they just immediately get terminated and the process stops? Or have you found that the process keeps continuing forward? I have literally never seen a job offer completely pulled because someone counter offered. Um, it, it, it just doesn't happen. So I think you hit the nail on the head that there's fear. And I think a lot of it is that it's an uncomfortable thing to do. Um, and, and, and there's fear that's associated with this counter offer. And one of the fears is what if they pull the job offer? Another one that I hear pretty commonly is, well, I don't, I don't want to come off as an aggressive person and start off on the wrong foot with the hiring manager. Um, and, and I think, uh, I think those are legitimate fears. However, I can say from experience that they don't actually come to fruition. And that if, if you give into those fears and you don't negotiate because of it, you'll cost yourself a lot of money when in fact the job offer would not have been pulled and you would not have started off on the wrong foot with the hiring manager, uh, because, um, maybe they don't expect everyone to negotiate, but it's, they know it's a possibility that they're going to get a counter offer. And so they'll just respond. And the, like you said, the worst case, maybe what they say is, uh, you know, we, we made our best offer. And so we appreciate your counter, but we're not, we can't budge on our salary. And then you can decide whether or not that salary is appropriate, um, which is something maybe you and I should talk about is how do you decide like what the bottom end is for your 
acceptable salary. Um, yeah, but, but we I, should. And the, real quick, though, I just want to mention, it, guys, if they do actually terminate the the process at that point, it's actually a sign that it's a good job for you to not be at. Because a job where a company where they're respectable enough with themselves to say to you that they can't go any higher and, and they're sorry and are you okay taking the certain price, that shows a little bit of humility and a little bit of stand up uh a little bit of straightforwardness in their company culture, and that's great. And if they do end up terminating because you countered, that's typically a company you don't want to be at anyway. There's some kind of internal politics going on there, and trust me, you're better not being at that company anyway. So there's really no negative outcome from this, guys. Your brain is tricking you into thinking there is because it's a fear-based confrontation thing that looked just like Josh said. But if you think about it, logically, there's no negative outcome. Isn't that insane, guys? There's no negative outcome from renegotiating your salary before you even start the job. Can you believe that? So please put into practice these things that Josh is saying. These are very valuable things. And you can get 10% easily more than they're offering. 10% is easy. 20% is a little bit harder. Now, Josh, let's touch on what you were just saying a minute ago. How do you know that the job that they're how do, they, how do you know that the salary that they're offering is right for you? Maybe they don't want to budge and go higher. Uh, what sort of different values do you place on making that decision? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I'm i glad we can kind of backtrack here because it is a step that I left out when we started talking about negotiating that I think is a really crucial step. I call this uh, your minimum acceptable salary, which is a number that you set for yourself before you begin negotiating and pre preferably before they make you a job offer. And this is uh, the minimum acceptable salary. It's the minimum salary that you would accept to do the job. Um, and the way that you set that salary is first you start out with objective things like what is the market value for my skill set and experience in this industry for the position that I'm looking at. Um, and then you maybe zoom in a little bit and you say, well, what about in this region if I'm, if I'm going to move to a, a certain part of the country or um, at companies in this region that are similar to the one I'm interviewing at? And then finally, you know, what do I know about the actual company that I'm interviewing with? How well do they pay people? How badly do I want to work there? Um, you might adjust your minimum acceptable salary down a little bit. If it's an opportunity to work for a company that you've had on your bucket list and you're just really excited to be there, um, you might take a little bit lower salary for the opportunity to get into that company and get your foot in the door. On the other hand, if it's a company that maybe you're not super thrilled to be working for, you're not upset about it, but you're not, you haven't been dreaming about it, maybe you would raise your minimum acceptable salary so that you make sure that when you get in the door, you have a salary that you're very comfortable with. And so you start with that minimum acceptable salary. And now you know, regardless of what happens during the negotiation, that you will either get the job making that minimum acceptable salary because you were able to negotiate up to that point or higher, or you will not take the job because you did not make your minimum acceptable salary. And you'll know that you are out of a, a situation where you would have been unhappy with the salary that you would have gotten if you had taken that job. Yeah, and that, that's really interesting advice because a lot of the times I see people just going into the job getting whatever they're offered. And what you just identified is this directedness of intention. So like this concept of, I'm going to set my own goal salary based on my analysis of the region and the job and the history and my own performance in the past and my future responsibilities in this job. I'm going to set my own salary. Guys, very few people do this. Very few people actually project out and think and direct their life in that to that degree but you need to be doing that. If you're listening to this podcast and you're interested in education and growth, you need to be doing exactly like Josh is saying and actually directing your life in the direction that you want. And part of that is the salary that you want. And guess what? If the company can't meet it, then you're not going to accept the, the salary. How awesome is that? That you have the freedom to decide whether or not to accept a company's job offer and not just be so fear-based that you accept whatever offer comes to you you will feel happier living in a land of choices. So that, that what I, we've just identified is living with choices. You have all these different choices when you make the directions in your life yourself. And trust me, that will make you happier than living in this place where you just have to accept to make rent whatever salary is given to you. So keep that in mind as you're making this approach. Make sure that you set goals for yourself, set your acceptable salaries, and also check out these resources. I'm just going through these resources that Josh has at fearlesssalarynegotiation.com. And these are, these are excellent. And a lot of this stuff is, goes into depth on what we've covered here in this episode. And I, I really encourage everybody to go check that out once again. So the last thing that we're going to touch on is the phone call that you'll usually get after you've negotiated your salary over email. 
So we've walked all the way through what to do until you get to the point where you negotiate your salary, then you've done it, you've pressed send on that email. Typically what will happen is the comp company will want to call you because you've done something that obviously is best done over the phone. So if you if you sent that email, which is good to create that paper trail, they will then call you. So Josh, what sort of tips or advice would you give to people around this phone call? I think you described that part of the process really well. And I think my, my advice is, as, as with every other step of the way, I think a common theme to our conversation today, uh, Dane, has been preparation. And so you want to prepare. You want to think ahead. You're always thinking ahead. And so, for example, you're thinking ahead, I'm going to set my minimum acceptable salary before I get an offer so that I know for sure that if I accept the job, I'm at a salary that I'm happy with. And then I'm going to, I'm going to take some time and I'm going to think I'm going to calculate my counteroffer and make sure that I make a good counteroffer based on my situation. And then you're going to prepare and say, well, now that I've given them a counteroffer, I've narrowed the window of possible salaries that I could be making. And that window is now confined to somewhere between the offer that I was initially made and then the counteroffer that I made up top. It's going to be somewhere in there because it would be really unusual to make less than the initial offer that they made you or to get more than your counteroffer. Um, and so now you have usually a pretty small little window of salaries that you can look at. It's, you know, $5,000 total or $10,000 or $15,000 in this window. And you can start thinking about, well, what am I going to say if they come back to me at this part of the window, this increment? What am I going to say if they offer me a thousand less than my counteroffer? The answer is probably you're going to say, that sounds good, right? Um, what am I going to say if they offer me, if they stick to their initial offer? And the answer to that is probably something like, you know, what was my minimum acceptable salary and did we get there? Um, if they don't meet your minimum, you would say, I'm sorry, but I, I can't accept a job for less than my minimum acceptable salary. And now you've kind of put it back on them to take it or leave it with, with your minimum. Uh, and then in between, you have all these different layers. And so there are a couple of things that I like to focus on here. The first one is, first, you're going to focus on base salary. So you'll notice that so far we have not talked about any other benefits at all in the negotiation. And that's because base salary is the gift that keeps on giving. You wanna maximize that base salary. You'll get it this year, you'll get it next year. Every raise that you get will be based on that base salary. And so the bigger your base salary when you start, the more money you're gonna make this year, next year, and over your career. Um, and so it's important to maximize that base salary. So my whole strategy is focused on what's the maximum base salary that you can negotiate for yourself. Once you've maximized it, there are opportunities to focus on other things as well. And so you'll think about each increment in that window I described between the offer they made you and the counter offer you made. And you'll have some idea of where you'll go with salary in terms of what you'll say if they come back to you. So sometimes you'll say, that sounds good. Sometimes you'll say, uh, that doesn't meet my minimum. I'm sorry, I can't take the job except for uh, this salary. And then in between, you'll, you might jump up a little bit. You know, they came up 5,000, so you'll try to get them to go up another 3,000. And if they're unable to move up anymore and they don't meet your last ask, then you can start looking at things like, well, okay, so uh, I asked for 80,000 and you only came up to 75,000. You're stuck there. So uh, if you can do 75,000 and give me an extra paid week of vacation every year, that would be great for me and I'm on board. Um, and you see how they respond. So that's the point where you can start looking at those other benefits. So I think the two important things that come to mind for this particular phase of the negotiation are one, don't stop negotiating until you've maximized your base salary and focus on that first. Two, once you've maximized base salary, then that's when you might have a window that's open for you to look at the other benefits that people like to talk about, like vacation time and signing bonuses and um, paying for your home office expenses or a relocation bonus and that sort of thing. So that stuff comes at the very tail end and only if you're unable to push your base salary up as high as you're trying to push it. Okay, thanks guys for listening to this episode. I hope you had a good one. And again, today we spoke with Josh Duty, who is an expert negotiator and will help you in your career advancement as a web developer, as a Ruby on Rails developer, as a front-end developer. Josh, where can people find you online? Thanks for having me today, Dane. It's been a whole lot of fun. Um, you can find me, the easiest place to get in touch with me almost real time is on Twitter. I'm at Josh Doody, J-O-S-H-D-O-O-D-Y on Twitter. Uh, you can also find um, a lot of the stuff that I write is at joshdoody.com. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you can find my book and a lot of other salary negotiation and interviewing materials at fearlesssalarynegotiation.com. And for Start Here FM listeners, I've actually got a special offer set up and that's at fearlesssalarynegotiation.com slash Start Here FM. And what you can get is a guide on how to ace your next interview along with three email templates you can use at different points in the interview process when you need to follow up with a hiring manager or with a recruiter. 
Um, and so that is a really good summary of all the stuff that you and I talked about that had to do with interviewing and preparing and how to answer questions and all that good stuff is all in that guide. So that's at fearlesssalarynegotiation.com slash start here FM and you can get that stuff for free. Awesome, Josh. And again, guys, go check out his ebook. It's on Amazon, Fearless Salary Negotiation. Go sign up for his email list at fearlesssalarynegotiation.com and he will send you emails that will help you throughout this process. And that day, when that day comes where you're thinking, oh, you know what? I need a promotion. I want you to think the name Josh Duty and I want you to find one of his emails, hit reply on it and send him a question. And he will reply. He's a good guy and he's got great value to give you. Thanks, guys. See you next week.